speaking of captivating, after Canelo Alvarez knocked out Amir Khan in the sixth round two weeks ago, he had until Tuesday to agree to a fight with Gennady Golovkin or vacate his title. On Wednesday, the WBC stripped him of his title after not reaching an agreement, but Canelo is still confident the mega fight will happen. Stephen A., what does this all mean now? Explain this to me for Canelo and Triple G in this fight happening. Well, it shouldn't mean anything. Uh, Canelo will use it as an excuse potentially uh, to, to justify trying to get Triple G down below the 160-pound limit, try to get him to fight at 155. Canelo, I'm sorry, Triple G has made the case all along, why should I fight you at 155? You're the reigning middleweight champion. If this were Floyd Money Mayweather moving up from a, a traditional welterweight division to try and fight a middleweight and I had to meet him there, that would be different. But you are the middleweight champion. Now, Canelo not having the belt anymore can justify not having the fight at the 160-pound limit, thereby saying, Triple G, if you want this money and you want this mega fight, you're going to have to come down to 155. And he obviously is going to have the support of Oscar De La Hoya and Golden Boy Promotions, who are going to do everything they can to facilitate a situation that assists in, in Canelo Alvarez obviously winning because he's their ticket. He's their money man. And we all know that Triple G is bigger and presumably stronger. So it, it remains to be seen. It's the fight we all want. Oscar and them swear they want to give us the fights we want to see. And to me, I don't see the problem because even if Canelo loses to Triple G, I believe that Canelo will be every bit as big as he is right now because he's a big time fighter and he would be fighting the middleweight champion. It doesn't negate what he can do at the at the at the super welterweight division and beyond. So I just think that they gotta find a way to make this fight. I love Oscar De La Hoya. I like messing with him sometimes, but I respect the hell out of him. I'm a fan of what he does, but I hope he doesn't let me down. I hope he makes sure that this fight happens. I, I like your point, especially about 155 pounds. Makes sense to me. I, I still don't trust that Oscar De La Hoya, Golden Boy Promotions, want to give us this fight that we all clearly want yet. I'm just not convinced of that. They might have let this 15-day period expire, not just so they could renegotiate weight divisions and, and catch weight or whatever it's going to be, but... Are you sure that that they they want to or they don't want to protect that golden goose that is Canelo a little longer? Because I just don't think he could beat Golovkin right now. Now Golovkin's 34 years of age, Canelo 25 years of age. But are you sure that the strategy isn't let's let's pick at least one more, maybe two more winnable? makeable, sellable fights against smaller fighters where, where you can do the catch weight going down. And obviously there's Keith Thurman and Danny Garcia, Kel Brook. There, there are all sorts of good fights that you could sell and you could win. And if, if you go ahead and make this match now and you lose to, to Triple G as we both think that he would lose, you, you don't kill the Golden Goose, but you damage it a little bit, oh. right? Well, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And where I'm, where, I, where I'm losing faith in Canelo is what he said. I'll fight Triple G. I'll beat Triple G, but I won't be forced into the ring with Triple G, all of this other stuff. I get all of that. And I know there's some mega fights for him to fight at the welterweight division. And not only that, he's a money man. He's going to make the money because people have been running from Triple G so much. Triple yeah. G is much of a knockout artist as he is. He ain't the box office attraction Canelo has with the support of Mexico. In reality, though, is this. What you call him into the ring for? What you told the world you'll fight anybody, anywhere, anytime? What you do all of that for if you then are planning on not fighting him and fighting somebody else? That'll be an incredible fight right now. You say you're ready for him to be your next fight. If you didn't mean it, why call him out like that for? Completely unnecessary. Completely unnecessary. On both him and Oscar's part. We shall see. Your boy Jerry Jones is trying to get this one at AT&T Stadium. When, yep. and if I wouldn't mind that. Yeah. I wouldn't either. But I think, I, th I think this fight belongs in Vegas, though. Yeah. I mean, a 100,000-seat stadium, as big as that Jumbotron is, I get all of that. But I think a fight like this belongs in Vegas instead of Texas. We shall see. Can't knock Jerry's hustle, though. He's, he's always I on the forefront the of everything. All right, more first take after the break. There's something I need to get into with Stephen A.
The Cavs have yet to drop a game this postseason, and they are looking like the favorites to win it all. According to a column on CBSSports.com, the Cavs season took a turn for the better when new coach Tyron Liu told LeBron to shut the bleep up, I got this. In the huddle earlier this season, before Lou was hired, a person familiar with the internal workings of the Cavs said that the team felt they were doing this for LeBron instead of with LeBron. Stephen A., what do you make of this? Well, first of all, it's accurate. Um, I, I don't know about shut the bleep up. I mean, it's entirely plausible because Tyron Lou does talk like that on occasion. Um, I, I know for a fact, and we touched on it on this show, uh, that he really, really checked LeBron, and a few people checked LeBron when they played Miami, was down by 30, and he's sitting up there hugging and yucking it up with Dwayne Wade. That really, really rubbed uh, uh, Tyron Lue and others the wrong way, and Tyron Lue called them on it. And to LeBron James' credit, he manned up and fessed up and said, you're absolutely right. It's not something that'll happen again. I think that it could potentially be overblown because... They talk like that to each other. That's just their lingo, their vernacular. And there's no reason to sit there and highlight, shut the bleep up or whatever. Because, you know, dudes talk like that to one another from time to time. And it literally brushes off your shoulder. So it's nothing to make a big deal out of it. I can tell you that Tyron Liu has profound respect for LeBron James, as everybody on the Cavs do. How can you not? But where Ken Berger's uh, uh, report is accurate even more so and he does a damn good job so i'm certainly not trying to critique him or anything like that but i'm just saying i'm giving credit where credit is due where he's absolutely right is the kevin love component if you read this article kevin love was essentially relegated to being a spot-up shooter david black really didn't create anything else for him and kevin love was very very unhappy with playing that role and so because he was unhappy with playing that role, a lot of times when we saw him on the court and we speculated about him and LeBron and, you know, not getting along and all of this other stuff, Kevin Love may very well have had a problem with the system, per se, the system that was being employed. And LeBron James being on the court trying to execute the system, even though he didn't agree with it, in the end, you can see how acrimony can ultimately swell within the ranks. So what happens? Out goes Black. In comes Tyron Lue. And what does he do? He instantly gets Kevin Love the ball more. Not only that, it's not necessarily on, on the outside. Yeah, he's usually standing on the outside taking a three here or there. He's on the weak side when LeBron James is getting the ball on the block, whether it be the elbow or the block. But Kevin Love is there, too and he's getting touches in the paint area. And he's a more vital component of this offense because he's smart and he can play and he can pass. There's no excuse not to utilize him. So Tyron Liu figured that out. Outside of that, all they've been doing, according to what they've told me, meaning the players and the coaches, because uh, obviously I've spoken to several of them over the last several weeks, they said what we're doing most is A, we're resting, and B, we're shooting all the time. Skip, I'm there at pregame the other night before game one. I watched Matthew Della Vadova go from the left corner to the wing, all beyond the three-point line, the left corner to the wing, to the key, to the right wing, to the right corner. He hit nine of ten three-pointers. Nine of ten. Matthew Della Vadova. Because they say he puts in the work and nobody maximizes his potential more than Matthew Della Vadova. And that seems to be something in combination with a LeBron James who's a workout warrior, who is fixated on his conditioning, who constantly stays on guys to keep themselves in tip-top shape and be disciplined enough to do whatever it takes. The combination of those two, obviously on opposite ends of the spectrum, a role player, a superstar, and everybody in between is following suit. That's what's going on here. It has a lot to do with Tyron Lue, make no mistake about it, because the players respect him and his vision for what he wants to do. But they're going out there and executing it because they can, because of the ability and the commitment of their superstar and a role player who deserves a hell of a lot more credit than I've ever given him. Hmm. I'm going to tell you how much, how highly I regard what I read in Ken Berger's story. We all know Steve Kerr was voted coach of the year for the regular season. Maybe it was some sympathy vote because he went through a, a horrible back issue that almost threatened his career at some point. 
We know that a lot of people made a case for Terry Stotts being the regular season coach of the year. I'm here to tell you, I think Tyron Liu is making a late charge for coach of the whole year. I'm talking about regular season and postseason. Tyron Liu is showing me things that are shockingly good to great. And this is yet another example of that. So, Stephen A., if I do a step back here, and, and please respond to this, I look at LeBron, the, the totality of LeBron's career, I thought the best thing that happened to LeBron at age 26 was when he took his talents to South Beach and joined forces, not so much with Bosch, but with his best, best friend, best buddy, Dwayne Wade. I thought Dwayne was the best thing that could have ever happened to LeBron at age 26. He, he, he showed him the ropes. He showed him how you win basketball games at the highest level. He, he taught LeBron how to win a ring and then a second ring. And, and he was instrumental in, in just giving LeBron the peace and the comfort of knowing Dwayne's got his back. Dwayne's right there with him in the locker room, in the huddle, on the court. And then the second best thing that has ever happened to LeBron is that at age 31, he gets Ty Lue as his, his new head coach. And I think it's changing LeBron's later career professional life to have a guy that he already obviously respected. I kept telling you last year during the finals, and I, I, it, it seemed to happen almost on a nightly basis, and it, it, it made me laugh. But I, I kept saying, I've never seen anything like this. LeBron James would just ignore David Blatt. During the finals, he would put himself in the game or take himself out of the game with, without notice. Like, I think I'm going to rest now, so I'm going to go to the bench. And then David Blatt, we've seen him send in a sub. Nah, you, 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 you get back. We, we want to keep the same five on the floor for this inbounds play. Never seen anything like that before. So LeBron was the unofficial head coach of the team. And you know and I know it's tough to make that work because there's there are going to be some resentments on other players like, are we just chopped liver or what, what's going on here? And now LeBron is regarded, obviously, as a great player, as the best player on this team, but he's still a player with a head coach who has the last word. And so it was crucial whenever this happened, this shut up moment, it was crucial to just show the team, not LeBron, just show the team, I got this. I'll have the last word here. And if LeBron says, I'm good, then everybody's good, and, and they can actually become a basketball team. I just think it's essential. Well, I think it's great for LeBron James. All I'm saying is let's not act like something happened where, you know, Tyron Liu was just disrespectful to LeBron James. They're tight. He has tremendous respect for LeBron. Not to mention the fact that before any kind of conversation, whether it's him You're talking right. to LeBron about Miami or whether the whole situation with the huddle took place, before any of that happened, when Tyron Lue first took the job, Skip, you saw my interview with him yep. when he first got the job. He said one of the first things I did was have a talk with LeBron. You have to allow me to coach you. I have to treat you like I would treat any other player. I can't lead this team unless you allow me to do that. And LeBron James said, absolutely, no problem with it whatsoever. And so we have to look at it from that perspective and understand that we can't come across as saying like, like you know, Tyron Lue, yeah, he's running the show, but the hell with LeBron. He has LeBron's support yeah. because I don't care who you are as a coach. If you don't have the support of your superstar, you're not going to last and you're not going to be that effective. Just look around. Look around. Think about history. You've covered this game for a long time, Skip, as you so eloquently state on a periodic basis. You've covered this game. Pick the star you want. Pick L My Magic in L.A. Pick Jordan in Chicago, pre-Phil Jackson. Pick A.I. in Philadelphia. Yep. Pick anybody you want. If you do not have the support of the star, yep. you will not succeed. You will and be so fired. Tyron Lu that's yeah. right. Tyron Lou is Tyron Lou is succeeding yeah. because LeBron supports him. So let's make sure we keep that in mind. Obviously, if a brand new coach had come in with little to no relationship with LeBron and had pulled that stunt in a huddle, shut it's up. It's it's over, man. It's you you have burned the bridge because you would humiliate LeBron in front of the the rest of the players. Clearly, they had he's he was an assistant. He 
I, I'm, I'm not saying that LeBron demanded that he be elevated into head coach, but but clearly he was he was LeBron's guy. That that LeBron blessed that that choice, and so they absolutely. had absolutely yeah absolutely so, okay. So they had rapport. They had a connection. They might have even had a discussion that that Ty Lue says, hey, at some point in front of the team, I'm going to have to make it clear that I'm in charge, and. LeBron clearly went along with it because they are functioning right now at the at, highest level. Well, I'm saying it wasn't at any point. It was from the very beginning. Yeah. The moment he took over, they had that conversation. Yeah. And that was firmly established. And, and by the way, give David Griffith some credit because he's the general manager. He's the one that elevated Tyron Lu. Keep in mind that when he elevated Tyron Lue, Tyron Lue has never been the interim. He instantly got a three-year deal. Yeah. Prior to that, he was instantly the highest paid assistant in the game because he was perceived as being the heir apparent to David Blatt. This is a guy, Blatt, I'm sorry, Gri you know, uh, Tyron Lue, mm. that was Griffin's initial choice. Yep. It was Dan Gilbert no, who it. wanted David Black. Mm -hmm. Griffin always wanted Tyron Lue. Okay. And so when you look at it from that perspective, combined with the moves that he made to 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 buffer the 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 roster of this franchise, it's the combination. Yeah, Tyron Lue's got a really good relationship with LeBron, and LeBron respects him, and that's cool. But he also has the support of the GM, yeah, who wants to prove to everyone that he could do this job, that this is his team, not LeBron's. Yeah. And so the combination of that really puts Tyron Lue in a very, very comfortable position. It does. I agree. To lead. So you, you have gone out of your way lately to pay your respects to David Griffin for all the personnel moves that I he do. has made. Okay? And I get you, and I'm with you on all of the above. But for me, from a distance, the single best new move, new addition, that gives LeBron the best chance to win his third ring is this new head coach. That's just me. Absolutely. Sure. Above uh, no, 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 Channing no. You're, 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 whoever, yeah. you're, to you're totally right. But what I'm saying to you is don't just look at the move. Look at the particulars. He could have brought him in there and gave him the interim tag. He instantly put him in there, and from day one, he had a guaranteed three-year deal, basically guaranteed two years, option on the third, partial guarantee, that kind of stuff. But he instantly instantly made sure there is no interim here this guy is going to be here next year so all of this noise about oh my goodness he's got to get to the finals he's got to do this or that otherwise he'll be gone and they shouldn't have let go of david black that has never been in david griffin's plans it has never been part of the plan in tyron lou's eyes yeah they made the decision from day one i got you tyron lou is the new head coach i know that helps is and, what i'm saying and since that he helps. took over to me I don't see any other coach doing a better job in this period that Ty Lue has been the head coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers. I agree with that. I agree with that. But how do we ignore, you know, uh, uh, you know, Kevin Love? How do we ignore Channing Fry? How do we ignore the fact that you have these people? Listen, I'm going to be critical when folks deserve it, and I'm going to be fair and complimentary when they deserve it. David Griffin, to me, did a bad job last year of getting, of securing the point guard slot. He should have had a backup to Kyrie Irving, all right? But outside of that, I thought he did a pretty good job. This year, I think the man has done a fantastic job. I got to give credit where credit is due because I'm damn sure going to call him out if I think he did a bad job. Yep. So why wouldn't I do it if I think he did a good job? I think he's done a really good job. I really do. We have more on new moves in just a minute, but of course tonight it all goes down. Game two will be just as easy for Lou and LeBron. That is 8.30 on ESPN as they look to take a 2-0 lead in the Eastern Conference Finals when they face the Raptors. Our coverage begins with NBA Countdown, charged by due with Sage, Jalen, and Doug. That is at 7.30 Eastern.